Hey everyone, this is Jeff Risto with the Detroit Lions Podcast and Lions Wire, and I have got a mailbag for you today. Happy uh, Easter for everybody out there, uh, if you're watching this on Easter. Uh, this is actually being recorded on Friday. Uh, I'm going to be out of commission for a little bit, uh, spring break with my family. So uh, we're recording this a little bit early. So some of the information that you hear might be dated. Uh, the questions came in throughout the week uh, from the Detroit Lions podcast Slack Patreon channel. It is indeed the smartest Lions chat on the internet. We're trying to steer it back that way. We get a little loose lately, but we'll be good. So uh, without further ado, let's get to some of y'all's questions. Um, let's see. I... I sort of pre-screened these, but I didn't really think about the answers. I was more looking at the questions that, that interested me more uh, to answer. So, um, uh, from Big West Kinnivan. Kinnivan, I should know that. Sorry, Wes. Do you think the Lions signed a free agent offensive tackle or safety before the draft? We are not very deep at either position. Well, your second assertion is certainly correct. The Lions are indeed not very deep at either spot. Uh, right now, the number three tackle on the team is Dan Skipper. The Lions have been loath to play Dan Skipper at tackle. Oh, he's the sixth tackle, and he's great at that. That's his role. After that, you got Connor Galvin, who was an undrafted free agent last year, who is way too tall for his own good. He's six foot nine. His arms are so long that he just can't fire them out fast enough to handle the NFL level. Uh, that was obvious from the second day of training camp. So they need help there. Safety. Right now, the number four safety on the roster is Brandon Joseph, another undrafted free agent from last year, who you might remember was really, really good at Northwestern, went to Notre Dame and stunk. Um, that, that, that's your name. Um, so, and, and with Iffy injured the way he is a lot, and with uh, Kirby Joseph having some injury issues going on, you better believe that they need help. Now, si free agency is a little bit tricky right at this point. This is going to preempt some other answers. Uh, and I talked about this a little bit last week uh, in, the, in the solo show that I did. If you're a free agent right now, you don't want to sign. You want to wait till after the draft so you know where your spot is. Um, let, let's say let's say you're a free agent of safety right now. Um, I can't think of any off the top of my head. Uh, Justin Simmons, great example. Actually, it's probably not a great example because he would start pretty much anywhere. Uh, but the, let's say there's a free agent of safety out there who would be competing to be number three, number four safety. You don't want to sign now before the draft when the Lions could draft a safety in the third round, second round. That wipes out your spot. That means you're fighting now instead of you know fighting for a role on the team. You're fighting to make the team. So I I don't see that, Wes. Um, and and it's not that the Lions don't want to address the depth situation, but it's, it's just the timing of the draft. Now we are we are less than a month away from the draft. Free agents don't really want to sign unless they are very confident in their roles. And I don't think that the Lions are going to give that sort of confident assertion to anybody. Um, offensive tackle market, by the way, is trash. Uh, you saw what Matt Nelson got from the Giants. Look, we know he's not good. Uh, and they're paying him a fair amount of money. Hope so. Uh, I, I, think those are, I think those are draft needs. And then after the draft, you might see a veteran or two get released because, oh, we drafted your replacement. My agent is going to come with a trade demand now, or, or cut me because you, you you know you drafted this guy. So that will happen. Um, try not to fret too much about that depth right now because uh, the free agents that are out there are not great. Um, good question. All right, from Mongo, how do you see the wide receiver room shaking out? We know they expect a large jump from Jamo. Absolutely, he is wide receiver two. End of discussion. Doesn't matter who they draft. JMO is number two to start the year. End of discussion. They brought back DPJ. They did. He'll compete. Depth roll. Khalif Raymond will compete for a depth roll. Um, well, this question actually came in before Josh Reynolds signed. Uh, Josh Reynolds, by the way, is now in Denver. We all know that. Um, I'll just real quickly um, steal into Mago's question here. Um, Josh Reynolds and the Lions did talk. Uh, it was clear that Reynolds was going to be looking for more money. It was also clear that the Lions weren't like super interested in bringing him back. Like if he wanted to come back, that's fine. 
Uh, but he was going to have to take a lot less money than he got from Denver. And uh, there was, let's just say there was people in his camp that were encouraging him to, you know, maybe try to find a, a better place um, away from some of the toxicity of certain Detroit fans. Um, I put this in the Slack the other day, and I mean it. Um, Detroit versus everybody is pretty cool, but it's awful when it's when the everybody includes Detroit. Uh, it's rough, man. And uh, I know that Josh took some of that, and I know that he took some of it to heart. And uh, that's unfortunate, but that's that's part of being a pro athlete. It's part of being a public figure. That just you got to be able to handle those things. And if you don't have to handle those things, if you can get away out, he took it. I don't blame him for that. Um, but the money was certainly a big factor there. So wide receiver room. I'm going to say Brown, JMO. Then you've got Khalif, Khalif, who might be ready. We don't really know. Um, that's actually one of the later questions. I'll answer it now. We don't have any update on Khalif Raymond and his status um, or what the exact injury was. There were talks of a PCL, talks of a uh, patellar tendon. I don't know. Um, they don't seem overly concerned about it. Like the Lions have always been very upfront about injuries. Like, if this guy's hurt, we're going to tell you where he's hurt, how severe it might be. They, they do a pretty upfront job about that. So I, I'm not going to worry terribly about Khalif, but the, the unknown status is a little concerning. There's your top four right now. Antoine Green. Hopefully he can make a jump. He will be given a chance to make a jump. He's big. He can run down the field. Um, downfield routes were decent last year. Got some growth to do um, in terms of his overall precision and attention to detail, but you know he, he can shift. It's a chance to work on that. I think very strongly they're going to add at least one wide receiver in the draft. And one of those, um, whether it's Xavier Leggett in the first round, whether it's Luke McCaffrey in the third or fourth, if they make a trade into the fourth, um, whether it's you know um, Ryan Flournoy late on day three, somebody like that um, that I know that they've looked at. I do expect a wide receiver to come in, but I don't expect them to overtake JMO or Alan Ra for the top two spots early on. Um, but, you know, the potential's there. Like Josh Reynolds had, what, 60 catches last year? None of the people's Jones can do that. Um, I, I put them roughly equivalent in terms of impact that they can have on the Lions team. So if you're a DPJ believer, you probably think that he could be wide receiver three. I won't fight you on that. But I would like to see them interject somebody else and i do think based on conversations i've had at pro days and uh at the combine that they are looking maybe not first round but second third fourth um in a very deep ridiculously deep loaded class um malafat corley is the name that comes up um malik washington from virginia is the name that comes up as a guy who can also be your return specialist uh, and that's that's a role that they also need. You know, there's there's potential there for them to take it. So I, I think that wide receiver two slash three or three slash four isn't on the roster right now. Uh, they're going to bring somebody in for that. But uh, when and how much they prioritize that, we'll see. All right, more questions here um, from Chef James. Does anybody know if Emmanuel Mosley has made progress? That's a good question because. I think we forget about him collectively as a Lions Nation about uh, Emmanuel Mosley coming back. He was going to be cornerback one last year, coming off of an ACL. Now, his rehab last year took a little bit of a detour um, just before training camp started, is my understanding of it. Uh, because he was, he had. The word was that he was going to be ready for maybe not the very start of training camp, but like the the second week and be ready for the first preseason game. Uh, and that didn't happen. Played two games or played two snaps in the Carolina game, tore the other ACL. Again, it's a so this is in this is in October. So he is now six months out, close to six months out from the surgery. He should be doing okay. Um, another three months is when you're starting even the training camp. Uh, again, this is this is it's uh, March 29th. Um, training camp usually starts around four months from today, so that'll be ten months. We're hopeful that he will be cleared to at least have light activity. Uh, one of those things where he will 
probably start on the PUP, uh, training camp on the PUP, or non-football entry list as it might be, whichever one, they're effectively the same. Uh, and we'll see how close he can get, but it would be great if he was available by September 1st uh, for that first game, because uh, he is right now, tentatively anyways, quarterback number three. Um, your starters, Carlton Davis, Amik Robertson on the outside. Emmanuel Wilson would be number three, and he can push Amik for number two if he's healthy. Um, we'll see about that, though, but we have not heard anything uh, on the Mosley front. And uh, by the way, uh, we, we did actually ask that of Dan Campbell. So he, he, he was sort of deferential on that. Like, eh, don't really know. Let, let, let's, let me change the subject. And you know that if Dan doesn't know, he's going to tell you he doesn't know. And I, I believe him that he didn't know. So, all right. Let's go on. Well, this is a good one for the gold member. That, I love that name. That's great. <laughs> Cheers. Is it surprising that a player like Kevin Zeitler was not retained by Baltimore and only got a moderate one-year deal? Okay. A little bit, yes. Yes, it was. Um, this is Malcolm, so I'm just going to call him Malcolm. What's up, buddy? Um, so Zeitler is 34. He did injure his knee at the end of the season. That probably didn't help his market at all. He was being picky about where he wanted to be. He he's he's in ring whore mode, like no doubt about it. And the fact that ring whores want to come to Detroit is <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty good state of of uh, of where the team is at. The money is decent for him. Uh, he probably could have got a little bit more if he wanted to go play for. Oh well, uh, who's not good? Um, Arizona. Um, Pittsburgh, actually Pittsburgh would have made sense for him, but he's in Detroit and I'm grateful that he's in Detroit. And I talked about him in the, in the solo show. So uh, my thoughts on, on Zeitler are there. Um, check it out. If you liked and subscribed, you would have known when that episode came out and you can also find it in the, the archives there on YouTube. Uh, that that's a great way to, to go about that. All right. Another one from Malcolm, cause he doubled up and I like this question a lot. You did five players. You'd love the lions to draft. That's at Lions Wire. Check it out. Google it. Um, maybe, maybe we can even put a link in here. I don't know. We'll see. Um, who are five players you've seen mocked to us you don't want them to draft? Okay. Harmless. Got to think now. Chop Robinson is number one. I don't think he's a good fit. Um, I think he's a great athlete. I don't think he's a great football player. He, had, he reminds me of Aziz Ojulari. Uh, who was a second round pick, um, undersized, although uh, Chop's a little bit bigger than him, but has shorter arms. He was great at creating pressure, but, and the butts are where they get you, his conversion rate from pressure to sack was abysmal, like terrifyingly bad. For a guy to get, I, I think the number was 110 pressures and only get four sacks, like, Let's, let's think about this for a second. What's the Lions' biggest weakness on defense? Defending running quarterbacks, or quarterbacks who can run, who can also throw. Getting pressure on those guys is actually really bad if you don't finish, because then they're free to run, and you've got one less defender that can stop them. Uh, I, I don't like that fit at all. Um, I would rather roll with James Houston if we're going to go with an undersized speed uh, potential rusher. Um, there and James Houston's already on the roster. He knows the defense. He's shown he can finish. Um, I'm not sure that in 2024 that Chop Robinson would be that much more impactful for the Lions than what than what James Houston would be. Um, other ones that are out there. I am not an Ennis Rakestraw guy. I get I get the appeal, uh, but for him to be mocked in the first round, I I don't see that at all, man. Um, Chris Abrams drain his teammate at Missouri um, for my money is a better prospect um, for overall uh, and probably for the lions too. He's not as big. He's not as athletically freakish, um, but rake straw. I don't know. I, I, I just didn't see it with him. Um, he's good. He's fine. Like I won't hate it, but I would prefer that they go in a different direction there. Uh, trying to think of some other guys who I'd see mocked. 
to the Lions that I'm not a fan of. Uh, not really mocked much to the Lions because they're usually off the board by that, but I have seen it once. Oh, uh, that's Amarius Mims out of Georgia, the giant offensive tackle. Look, he's loaded with potential. He's very raw. He's inexperienced and he's injury prone. This is a guy who hurt himself at the combine, hurt himself again at Georgia's pro day. Had time, missed time last, last season. He had the high ankle sprain. He had the, uh, the tightrope surgery. Um, and then it didn't take. Um, that, that's sort of what happened with Tua. Uh, I worry a lot about, there's a lot of questions there that can get answered by other players in that range that just as well. Um, Mims, Mims could wind up being spectacular, um, and I wouldn't bet against him, but there's a lot of variables there that I'm just not comfortable with for this team. Um, having said that, Brad will probably really like him because he's injured all the time. That's a joke. That's a joke. Get over it. Get over yourselves. It's good. Uh, two others. Um, hmm. I'm not the biggest Kool-Aid McKinstry fan. He's good. I think, I think a lot of the reason why Lions fans didn't like Cam Sutton in coverage, in man coverage specifically, show up with Kool-Aid. He's better when he's looking at the quarterback. And he doesn't always, he doesn't have that balance of, I'm looking at the quarterback, I'm playing the receiver. I'm, I've, I've got my hand on the receiver um, without holding him to judge where he's going. Like, I just, he, he will, he will take that pause at the, at the break on the route. Like, let's say it's a seven yard, then it's a stem route. And he either wants to go on a post or an out or a, a fly, continue down the field. Cam Sutton always paused there. Kool-Aid has that in his game too. Now he's probably a little bit better of an athlete, uh, and, and he's a good player. But I just, again, with other options being present, I would rather explore those other options there. Um, sounds like I'm down in the cornerback class. I'm kind of am, but uh, one more. Let's go. Let's go offense. Ah. Oh, Devondre Sweat. There, there's my fit. I want to see him mocked the Lions in a little while, uh, but early on there was some momentum for him. Uh, he's not, he's not better than DJ reader at nose tackle. And I'm not fond of drafting a nose tackle in the second round. A guy who's going to get one and a half sacks, um, a handful of pressures. He's not as good as Jordan Davis was, uh, coming out of, of Georgia. Um, he's much more in the Andrew Billings mold, except he's bigger and less mobile side to side. That's a fourth or a fifth round value, um, for me. And I, by the way, I think it is for the lions too, especially now that they've added reader. So I, I don't think that was realistic, but he's also a guy that I, I just don't see them, the value commensurate with where he would need to be drafted. Um, I think the Browns are taking him in the third, by the way, if you're looking for bold predictions. Um, Let's see here. No, 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 no. Who is this year's Keely Ringo? Media projected first runner the league will not be as high on. That's a good question. Um, comes from, from FMS. I will say, <laughs> it's funny because uh, I just got done writing about Michael Penix Jr. in his pro day, uh, which was yesterday. The Lions were there. Uh, the Lions were not looking at Penix. They did have... Um, Let's say a, a keen eye on the receivers and offensive linemen that George or that, that Washington offers. Um, Troy Fatane would be a fantastic first round pick. I think he's going to be long gone. Uh, but guys like Jalen McMillan, uh, Jalen Polk, uh, they are certainly going to draw some interest there. Um, Roger Rosengarten as a, an offensive tackle. Um, let's talk about Rosengarten real quick um, as a diversion here. If you go back in Brad Holmes' history, uh, they used a pick on their current right tackle um, at, for the Rams. Uh, coming out of Wisconsin, he was the same sort of player, a function over form player. Uh, that's what Rosengarten is. Now, Rosengarten is a little bit better of an athlete, uh, but uh, th that's his comp. And I can see that the Brad Holmes will be find some appeal to Roger Rosengarten in the second or third round if he's there uh, as a kind of, you know, depth Depth tackle for rookie year, second year maybe, who, who develops into something that, that can start down the, the line. Um, so I, I do think that the, there's some interest there 
from the Lions. Back to the question, though. Who's this year? Ennis Rakestraw might be one of them. Um, I think Michael Penix, I don't think he's getting drafted before the third round. I just the the injury history, the fact that he's left-handed, which is stupid, but it matters to the NFL. It really does. <laughs> like it, 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 there's the NFL doesn't always think right, and that's one of the cases where they just don't. Um, it, it goes counter to what they do. Um, I, but I do think the injury history, the age, um, the fact that he, what made him most effective was his threat to run. And now because of the injuries, he's modified his game such that he doesn't. I, I think he's one. Uh, Sweat is one. I don't think he's going before the 50s at the earliest. Um we we these are the these are the debates that we get into when when draft Knicks discuss things. Uh, I'm trying to think who else we think that the league isn't nearly as high on. Um, Ad Mitchell comes up some from Texas. Uh, he he's one of those guys that I think Xavier Worthy goes before him. Let's put it that way. Uh, Worthy's really really fast. I worry some about Worthy's ability to track the ball. He's He's sort of like Jamo, quite frankly, in that he your his speed alone will impact the game enough that he's got value, even if he doesn't always catch the ball all that well or track it all that well. Um, if he, um, yeah. So there's one. Olu Fashanu is an interesting one. I've seen him mocked in the teens. I've also seen him outside the first round. I'm not an Olu guy. He's not in my top 30 picks, um, my top 30 big board. Um, all that, by the way, is available at DraftWire. Please check that out. It's great to be cheesy, but you got, you got to self-promote these days. I mean, hey, I regularly appear on the huge show. Um, self-promotion is not above me or below me. <laughs> I've learned from huge well. Hi, Bill. I hope that the Lions don't go with Olu Fashana either because uh, he's one of those guys – Interesting prospect. I'm not big on him. Um, I'm gonna take a little bit of a break here. I uh, need to warm up my coffee and uh, perhaps get some water because I'm about to cough something fierce. So I'll be right back. Back for the attack. Best docking album, by the way. George Lynch's work on Mr. Scary. Incredible. But I digress. Back to the questions from John Miller. What's your opinion on why they haven't signed St. Brown or Goff or Decker to new deals, especially Do Decker and Goff to create cap room? It's a very good question, John. I don't know why they haven't done it. I know that they have been talking with Amon Ra and with Goff for some time. Whether it's a, an issue of money or how much gets guaranteed or bonus or whatever. Um, it's, I don't want to say concerning, but it's interesting that they haven't done that yet when so many other teams are doing that. Um, in fact, uh, just saw the Houston Texans redid Titus Howard um, just before I started recording this. Uh, that's the kind of deal that you can sort of, you know, expect Decker to maybe get. We'll see. Sorry. Okay. Let's Off. Goff is interesting because the longer he waits, the higher his price tag goes. You know, it, it, that market doesn't go down. So if he was going to get $42.5 million a year with $30 million of that guaranteed over the course of a two- or three-year deal, what happens if Dak Prescott signs for more than that? What happens if another quarterback um, gets gets a big raise? Like, that's that's the dangerous game that you play if you're both the team and Goff. I I am a believer that Jared Goff doesn't play for the money. Like as somebody once said, you know, how much more money do you need um, when you're making you know thirty million dollars a year? There is a respect factor to it though, and that's I would be surprised if the Lions don't get something done with Goff this season, um, whether it's before just before opening day um, or, you know, before training camp or right, right as training camp starts, that wouldn't surprise me at all. But it's, look, he's under contract for next year. 
And while you want to avoid the, the Kirk Cousins shenanigans of him, you know, hitting free agency every year, and then you either have to tag him, which by the way, would be a big raise for golf. And he wouldn't necessarily be opposed to that. Um, or his agent wouldn't be opposed to that or advising him to do that because it will be more. Um, and then you get to be free agent again. The only issue that you would have on that, well, there's two, although Cousins dispelled the injury one because he got loaded from, from Atlanta, um, is if you suck. And I don't think that Jared Goff thinks he's going to suck. Um, I don't expect him to suck. I don't think many people listening to this expect him to not be great. So he might want to ride that out. Don't don't discount that. Um, Amon Ra, I don't know why that deal is done. It's that, that one's weird to me because I, I think the general parameters for what he needs to get paid are pretty much there and. You know, that, that, that's, that's an interesting one, um, but we'll see. I don't know. It's a good question. Um, Decker, by the way, Decker would be one of those where you add a year on, give him a crap ton of signing bonus, um, add another void year on, free up cap room for this year if you need it. Right now, they don't really need it, so that might be why they're not doing anything with that. And, and he buys you one more year with Decker as your left tackle, um, which would be through 2025, 2026, um, potentially, so... That's not that's not a super urgent one, um, in my opinion. We'll see what happens with that. All right. I like this one from Sam. What's your estimate of opportunity cost between a guard at the end of the first and end of the third round? All right. So we're looking at the guards that are available at the end of the first. Guard centers. Well, I'm going to put that together. I think JPJ, there's a chance he'll be there. He's another one of those guys that I think that we collectively in the media, and I'm guilty of this certainly, um, think he's better than what the NFL necessarily thinks he is. Um, Having said that, I I still think that the NFL, most NFL teams, or at least enough to draft him, will view him as a top 25 prospect that he will be gone. Graham Barton as well, um, his pro day at Duke, he knocked it out. So you're not getting those guys. You're looking at... Troy Faltanu, maybe. Um, I'm a massive Cooper BB fan. I will stand for him all day. I don't think he's going at 29. I think he's a candidate if the Lions trade back uh, into the middle of the second or something like that. Um, he's the type of player that you could get there. Um, but go, go, let's go down to the third. Okay, Christian Haynes out of Connecticut. I'm not his biggest fan. He's got a lot of illegal hands to the face penalties that didn't get called in college. We know the Lions' history with that. Um, and just in general, his hands wind up being too high. I uh, can be taught. He's certainly got the snarl, um, for it has the moving ability to, to, to make it happen. Um, Christian Mahogany, I'm a big fan of his out of Boston college. He should be available down there in that third round. The drop-off probably isn't that severe. Uh, there's, there's some good guards later in this draft, um, that, that can be had Zach Frazier first round to go back to that would probably be the most likely guy to go in the first. Uh, he can play center. He's better at center. He's interesting because he's he's pretty good. He's he's definite definitively better than guys you could get at the third. But how much more? It's not as great as the difference between getting Xavier Leggett at twenty nine and getting who's the receiver that would be down there. Um, um, the guy from Georgia, Jacques Saint. Um, uh, Jack Saint, uh, Jalen Polk from Washington, Malik Washington. Uh, who else is down in that range? Um, Jerry Rice's kid, Brendan Rice, is probably a third rounder. I'm not very high on him. Uh, wrote him for a Lions Wire if you want to check that out. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not a big fan there. Um, sorry, just not. Um, gotta call him like I see him, and you gotta stand by that. Otherwise, otherwise, you're, you're working for Multer football, and you don't want to do that. Um, yeah, the, the, so I, I try to compare like the positions, like offensive tackle, who can I get at 30 or uh, 29 versus who can I get at uh, 70, what is it? 78, 72. I don't know. It's too many numbers. So I just picked up weird stuff. Yeah. Um, there's, that's, that's a, that's a greater variance there than what you get at offensive interior offensive line. So I do think that if you're going to pause out of position um, of, of relative importance to the Lions, because they do absolutely have to get somebody in to take over for Kevin Zeitler in a year, 
um, to possibly take over for Frank Ragnow in a year. Yeah, that's you can wait a little bit. Um, although I, I will say this: if they want the center, the component, they got to get that in the first or second uh, because you, you can't wait. The, the drop off to guys like Cedric Van Pran, uh, that's that's a pretty steep drop. Um, and not not that Van Pran can't play, but there's there there's a definitive line there um, um, in the relative order of position value. If, if that makes sense there. I had, I had to throw a bull in the ash. Thanks, buddy. All right. Um, uh, if you see someone having a breakout season from what, from within the roster this year, um, who apart from JMO do you think that would be? I'm paraphrasing the question, shortening it up a little bit. That's from, that's from Simon. Hi, Simon. Um, uh, Ali McNeil, I think, can break out more than what he did last year already. I I absolutely believe that. I think you have not seen the best football from Kirby Joseph yet. I think he's got a chance. If he doesn't have to worry as much about the corners on the outside, he can focus more on being better at what he is, which is a robber type of free safety who can also come up and allegedly impact the run. He's getting better at tackling. He's still got some work to do there. He's one. Uh, I think what you saw from Derek Barnes last year can can get built on. Um, Jack Campbell is, a, is an easy answer, too, because uh, he, I thought the Lions gave him too many things to think about as a rookie, and I think that, that stunted his development a little bit. I think you're going to see him understand his role and the NFL game better this year, and I think he will be a better linebacker in year two than he was in year one. Breakout? I don't know. Like, there's a lot of good young linebackers in the league. He's one of them. Um, it would be nice if he went into the next tier or two up from that, um, because uh, he's certainly got that potential. Um, he's one. And I brought this up a couple times. Uh, brought it up in the in the solo show. I did Levi Anzarike? If he's healthy, Terrell Williams will get the absolute best out of him. He will bring out the dog in him. He will bring out the technical savant in him if it's there. Uh, so I wouldn't discount the fact that that he could do it. Now, having said that, he might also not make the team. Like, there's that wide of a variance with with, with Levi O. So, I don't know. Fingers crossed on Colby Sorstall because I know some of you are thinking that, but I I'm not there yet with him. Um, I'm not displeased but I need to see more before I get excited about Colby Sorstel. Um, that's probably the fairest way to say that. <laughs> oh, wow. I like this one. Um, this is a good question for, from Rev Lola Lion. Mike, could you take a moment to talk about the behind the scenes for day three undrafted free agents? Um, I'm going to give you examples. When do Brandon, the front office, start contacting potential UDFAs? What goes into that process? That's a fascinating question. Um, and every team does a little bit differently, but in general, they will they will start calling people Friday night, um, calling agents specifically. Like, hey, if your guy falls, like we might consider taking him sixth, seventh round. We might be looking at him like right after the draft. Or if it's a guy that nobody really expects to get drafted. Uh, uh, Trevor Nowoski was an example of this last year. The Lions contacted uh, his people very early Saturday, before Saturday started, and were like, "Hey, you know, we would we're very interested in, in bringing you in as an undrafted free agent. You know, other teams are going to be calling you too. And just know that you know your hometown team. We like you. We like you a lot, um, and and would would prioritize that. So that some of that groundwork goes on then." Uh, it won't be Brad doing the calling. It will be staffers. It uh, might even be Ray Agnew that are doing the, the the calling during Saturday, like the fourth or fifth round. And they're, they're seeing, okay, like this is how our board has played out. Like it, we've got this guy who's at this point on our board. We're probably not going to draft him, but we want him. Um, and they will call the agent um, or representation would be sometimes it's even a college coach just to, to reaffirm that you know hey this this guy worth us getting you know um and it would be coaches that they trust but that goes on quite a bit behind the scenes um throughout saturday it's a very very busy day 
uh, for, for GMs, for staffers, obviously. Um, it's also my busiest day of the year. Uh, last year, uh, I wrote and published 279 things on Draft Saturday. Yes, that's not an exaggeration. 279. So you won't see me on Saturday. It happens to be my favorite day of the year, too, because it's the day where you find out if your draft analyst really knows what they're talking about or if they only know the top 50 or so prospects. I love day three because it separates the wheat from the chaff there. Um, I know folks like Emory Hunt, um, Chris Trapasso, um, Trevor, Trevor Sycama, uh, John Ledyard, guys like that. We we relish day three. We love that. Brian Bosarge was a deep fried draft um, for draft countdown as a big uh, day three proponent as well. Um, some of the guys that I like, if they put out draft guides, buy them. Russell Brown, can't forget my guy Ross from Detroit Land Podcast on Lions Wire Zone. He knows these guys inside out as well. And I would guess, I don't want to speak for you, Russ, but I think you're a day three guy too. So yeah, uh, that's a good question. That's actually something that I wish that the NFL Network or ESPN would like camp out with a couple of those guys that you know might. Like like a kicker. Um, the Iowa punter is a great example. Um, he might get drafted, but he's going to be one of those guys that like when the when the draft is over, if he's not drafted, people are going to be calling him, and it would be it'd be cool to see like how early they're calling him, um, and what teams are calling with interest. Um, that would, that would make a great like if they did like a, a behind the behind the scenes thing with that. I'd I'd like that a lot. Um, hard knocks of the the draft life, you know, something like that. I'd watch. I think most people watching this video would watch too. Uh, wrap up with a couple more questions here. Um, I'm going to do one that's just in general. This is this is. There's a couple questions here on it. Um, it's also come from from the Twitter sphere um, feedback that I got um, about Nate Sudfeld. Everybody knows. If you don't know, you're learning now. I'm not a Nate Sudfeld guy. I've never seen a quarterback who's been employed this long who throws as many passes low and erratically as consistently as Nate Sudfeld does. And this comes back to seeing him at the Shrine game, um, 2017, 2016, whatever it was. And, like, he couldn't throw over the middle of the field without, like, bouncing balls. Um, he just, for whatever reason, he's a tall guy and he throws down. His motion is such that the ball goes down. But I'm not upset that the Lions signed him. He's quarterback three. He's going to hold the clipboard. Jared Goff trusts him. He knows the offense. He was here last year. Um, didn't didn't play well. Um, the Lions were already they already hit brought in Teddy Bridgewater um, to take over as the backup quarterback because they were like, oh, Sudfeld, no, no, can't play him. We got to get somebody better in um, in case Jared Goff gets hurt. We can't we can't go to war with Nate Sudfeld. Well. They're not going to know war with Nate Sudfeld this year either. He's on the team. He will be your third third quarterback. Hendon Hooker will be the backup. The Lions like Hendon Hooker a lot. Got to stave this off. Not enough that he's going to challenge Jared Goff. Don't misconstrue that. But they're very happy with Hendon Hooker's ability to come in if Goff were to get hurt and run the offense. Um, probably, probably to a level that fans um, who were somewhat skeptical of Hendon Hooker to begin with would be radically uncomfortable with. He's QB too. Do not mistake that. Um, and Sudfeld will come in and, and be a sounding board for a veteran who can help Jared Goff. You know, like you, you, you like to have that, that kind of guy around, you know, a, a, a contemporary of yours uh, who, who has seen some things throughout his time in the NFL um, so you're not always just like like grooming head and hooker to be the best head and hooker he can be, but you're also like learning some things like, or you know he'll see he'll see a look in a, from the Lions defense like why didn't I see that or what did you see on that that I missed? Um, and he can go to to Nate Sudfeld and Nate Sudfeld will give him that sort of feedback. I like that. I think that's a great addition. Uh, I expected him to come back. The money is not going to hurt, and he will be signed. And he is the sort of guy. That you can cut and you can put him on the practice squad. He'll be happy being there um, as your emergency quarterback. So happy with that. Um, even though I'm not fond of the player, um, he's better than Tim Boyle. Thank goodness that chapter is over. Um, so that was that was one that was just in general a general reaction one there um, from Grant. Tell me how to feel. 
Well, I don't like doing that. I'll just tell you how I feel. Um, our first round pick is, isn't a day one starter. Should I be worried we didn't get a player that makes the team better in 2024? Is, is our window that open? Or now that our window is open? I'm going to say, and this is a general statement, good teams don't draft for the current year. They draft for what needs you're going to have in the coming year. Um, look at teams like Baltimore, Pittsburgh, uh, San Francisco does this very well. They don't necessarily draft guys who have to play right away. They're looking at guys who can fill holes down the line. The Eagles do this too. They drafted Nolan Smith in the first round last year. He barely played. They drafted Nicobe Dean the year before that as a, as in the second round. He didn't play at all. Um, uh, didn't hurt them that much. You know, that's, that's where the Lions want to be. They aspire to be there and they're pretty darn close. I think the only potential starter that they would get in the 2024 draft with their first round pick would be if there's a wide receiver that comes in and just like lights it up right away. And you're like, we got to get this guy on the field with JMO and Amon Ra. Yeah, that that's, I don't see it. Uh, I don't see it. I don't see that edge there. It's not a good year for pass rushers. It's just not. Um, uh, Darius Robinson is not starting over Josh Pascal. Um, he's not, not as a rookie. Maybe, maybe he will earn that throughout the season, but week one, their starting lineup set. Defensive tackle, they're not starting over Aleem or, or DJ Reader. They're not. Linebacker, they're set there. They, they actually still have weird amount of depth. Rodrigo's linebacker five. He could start in some places. Now, that defense might not be that great, but he's, He's good enough to do those things. So, yeah, it's it's great. You're drafting a guy this year. Let, let's say, let's say Frank Reich now is going to retire, and he threatened to do it this year. I believe that he threatened. I believe that he was serious about that too. With, the, with all the injuries that he's had, you take Zach Frazier, 29, center out of West Virginia, great player. I'd be perfectly happy getting Zach Frazier there. Absolutely. And he comes in and he plays. He will play the three games that Reg now will miss just from various injuries, even though Frank is a war daddy. Um, he gets hurt. Part of the part of having Frank Reg now. Um, he can also play if Graham Glasgow gets hurt. He can play if um, Kevin Zeitler gets hurt, but he doesn't have to. Um, you get his feet wet a little bit and then take over for either Zeitler at right guard or uh or take over for right now if he retires. Like that's that's where they're at. That's that's the draft plan. If they draft an offensive tackle in the first round, obviously they're drafting for the future when Taylor Decker would be retiring or moving on to another team. Uh I don't anticipate that that's something that the Lions want, but you got to be prepared and they they do need a backup tackle anyways. Uh again, we talked about that earlier <laughs> like that's that's a glaring freaking need on the team. It's just number 3 tackle. So yeah, um, that it's weird. Uh, we're gonna have to, as a fan base and as a media, Detroit collectively, we have to get used to the fact that we're not drafting impact talent for right away. That was last year. We're not that team anymore. We're better. This team is as good as any team in the NFC on paper right now. Going into the year, if they had to start their current roster today, the Lions are running away with the NFC North. They are the best team in the division. They they lack some depth in some spots, but there there aren't any like immediate opening starters. And I know there are people that are skeptical right now. Are you ignoring outside corner? No, I'm not. I'm an, I'm an Amik Robertson believer. I loved that dude going out of Louisiana Tech. I like what I saw when when the Raiders played him in man. He played zone early on. They tried him in the slot a little bit. He sucked at both of those. He'll tell you that. He's an outside man. Press man, um, maybe maybe cover one type corner. That's where he's at his best. Um, he's short. He's not small. Uh, he can play. Now, will they bring competition in for him in the draft? Absolutely, I expect competition for him in there. But uh, as we talked about earlier, Emmanuel Mosley is on the roster too. If there's a guy who can beat out a meek, fantastic. But they don't have to have that. And that opens them up to do a lot of things in the draft. Let's let let's Brad cook whatever recipe he wants to go down. 
And I, I like that. Um, talked a little bit about the NFC there. There's another question on here, and uh, uh, that was about the, the pecking order in the NFC North. Detroit, Green Bay. Chicago is close to Green there Chicago is closer to Green Bay than they are to Minnesota. Minnesota at the bottom. And yes, they are probably the best last place team in football. Depending on what happens at quarterback, uh, I think they're gonna wind up with with Drake May. I'm not a huge Drake May fan. He's my quarterback five. Uh I have JJ McCarthy and Bo Nix above him. Uh I think that a lot of the discussion about Drake May is how great he can be. Um, that ignores a lot of really bad tape. Uh, he is not. I feel like we had this conversation about Will Levis last year um, when there were people that thought that the, the Lions might be interested in Will Levis. Like, he's really good at a lot of things, but doesn't show it consistently enough on tape. And some of it was the offense, some of it was the supporting cast. Like it just wasn't there for him, and that's that's certainly true of an excuse for Drake May. <laughs> but I uh, I'm not there with him yet. He could be great. We'll see. Um, yeah, but that's that's my pecking order. Chicago with Caleb Williams. I suppose we probably need to talk about it because he will be the number one pick. I'm not terribly concerned about it. I'm not sure that he be is better in 2024 than Justin Fields was for Chicago in 2023 and 2022. He's got a lot to learn at the NFL level. He's a very physically talented guy, and I don't, I don't worry about the uh, quirky personality. It's probably the the safe way to say that. I, I think he's fine. I think his teammates at, at USC accepted him for being Caleb Williams. I think his NFL teammates will as as well. Um, it's not any, not much different than what Tua was. Like Tua had the the church of Tua following him around. Like <laughs> he, I just think that there's there are holes in Caleb Williams' game that are not going to be easily erased at the NFL level, similar to the ones that that Baker Mayfield and Kyler Murray had to come out of with the same system. Um, you know that uh, it's going to take a little bit of time, but Bears have a good roster. They've had a great off season. Uh, Props to them, but they are they are a year behind the Lions, uh, and I will maintain that. And the ba the Packers, good football team, they're good. They're not to the Lions level, but they're good. I would expect them to be a playoff team, um, wild card team this year. So that's that. That's enough questions. I've I've talked for far too long. I'm going to go enjoy spring break with my family. I hope that you all, if you're on spring break, enjoy it. Have a happy Easter. Be safe. Be good to each other out there and uh, go Lions.